Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse 165, which reads as follows. Atana hikatang papang atana sankidisati Atana akatang papang atana vavisujati Sudhi asudhi pachatang nanyo anyang visodhaye Which means Evil is done by oneself by oneself is one defiled. By the self, evil is, n is left undone. By the self, indeed, one is purified. Purity and impurity are individual. Suddhi asuddhi pachatang. Purity and impurity are, are, are private. Nanyo anyang visodhi. One cannot purify another. It's one of the more famous Dhammapada verses. There was a monk I used to know who, who uh, every time he gave a Dhamma talk, he would start with this verse Sud, just the end part suddhi asuddhi pachatang nanyo anyang visodhi which is kind of funny because uh, this monk had a gun and he ended up chasing me through a forest one night screaming at the top of his lungs stories so um we have a story behind this one. The story is of uh, Julakala, which is kind of interesting. It's, it's the same as the story of Mahakala. So if any of you happen to remember, I think it was verse 161 or something. Recently we had a story of Mahakala, who was a man who um, seemed to have been innocently blamed for having stolen some goods. He was listening to the Dhamma, I think, at the monastery on his way back. He, uh, some, some thieves were, I don't know, he was bathing or something. Anyway, some thieves came and caught him there, or passed by him. They were being chased by, by the authority. And they dropped their loot by him, and the authorities thought it was him, and so they, they beat him to death. Uh, he wasn't a monk, this is a layman. So that was our last story. In this story, the same thing happened, only some, uh, some, some servant girls. If any of you are going, reading along with the English text, it says courtesans, like prostitutes or something, but it's not at all what the Pali says. It says some slaves with, or servants with uh, pots, you know, with water pots, on their way to fill the water, fill their pots, just servant girls. Uh, saw them beating this, this man, and they, and they knew he was innocent, and they somehow, I guess maybe they, they knew where he had come from. And they said, stop, stop, this man wasn't, he wasn't the one who stole those, stole your belongings. And somehow they convinced them and they stopped beating this uh, innocent man. And so the, lay, the, the Julakala goes back to the monastery and talks to the monks and he says, wow, it was amazing, these, these slave girls, these servant girls uh, saved me. I would have been dead if it weren't for them. And they went and told the Buddha and they were thinking, I guess thinking in relation to Mahakala, you know. Isn't it interesting how um, how he would have died 
he should have died in the very same way, but not through karma, but through the acts of these other these these servant girls. Right? It was because of them, not because of karma. It's, I guess the implication. And the Buddha says his life was indeed saved both by the uh, intercession of these servant girls. Kumba dasayo jeva nisaya atanoja. Also because atanoja akarana bhavina. Also because because of these girls, but also because he had not done. Uh, he had not done it. He was not guilty. And there's a double meaning, of course, there. It's not just that he was not guilty of having committed the crime, but he didn't have any basis of guilt by which he should be beaten to death. Uh, sometimes, perhaps you might say he, he, was, he was beaten, so he had some karma that caused him to be beaten but uh, not to death. And then he spoke this verse, so it's a rather short story. But again, we're back to karma. And, and the reason why there's a lot of stories here on karma is because this is the Attawaga, the, the uh, chapter on the self. And so the stories are all about self-reliance um, and... Uh, self-responsibility. You can't blame someone else for your problems. And you can't look to someone else for your salvation, which is basically, this this verse puts it quite well, suddhi asuddhi pachatang. No one can purify another. So there's a couple of lessons I think we can take, especially trying to focus on uh, specifically our meditation practice. The first is to talk about this idea of of somehow being um, being saved from from the results of or, or being saved from disaster by simply not having committed uh, uh, certain karmas that would lead to such a disaster. And so we, we get lot, I get lots of questions about karma and, and about this idea that it's just belief and, and the, the idea that it's, it sounds very magical. Um, and, and the idea, w how we want to think about karma is that it's... Um, we want to think about the, the reason why we get what we get is that it's random or chaotic with no pattern. Uh, and, and I think to some extent the Buddha acknowledges that it's chaotic or a better word might be complicated, that insanely complicated. And I think that's more scientific is not to talk about it as somehow chaotic but complicated complex um, but there's no denying that what we experience is based on causes of various sorts uh, I, I always think back to the tsunami the great tsunami that hit uh, Southeast Asia and South Asia because when I was I was I was in Thailand when it hit, and so many stories we heard, and all the stories were different, right? And so there's a question people always ask about the, you know, how how can you talk about karma when you're dealing with something like a tsunami where it hits everyone indiscriminately? But the the stories aren't indiscriminate. Yes, a lot of people lost their lives, but the the way they lost their lives and the the distinction between those who lost their lives and those who who were saved. Um, but I mean, f first of all, you you ad we admit that there is the cause of the tsunami. It wasn't just um, random people. It wasn't very complicated in that sense. There was a clear 
cause and effect relationship between the tsunami and death. And so there's a cause. We have cause and effect. Um, we also, to some extent, acknowledge the cause and effect relationship of the mind. And this is uh, where the meditation practice takes uh, takes the forefront. I mean, most of our meditation practice isn't interested in uh, past lives, right? For the most part, our practice of mindfulness, we're only really interested in something that we can clearly see as a cause and effect relationship here and now. Um, and, and, and from the past leading up to now, the habits that we've cultivated we aren't just magically the way we are, and we aren't permanently the way we are. Who we are is based on the causes that we have um, put in place to lead us here. You know, we're constantly striving after some certain thing, be it sensual pleasure, or be it a, a goal or a, an ambition. It's because of that that we are, in the present time, uh, partial or, or addicted to certain things. Also why we are restless and uncomfortable when we don't get what we want. So the very basis of karma is in, is in this, and this is why in meditation practice it's actually quite important for one to have an understanding of karma and why karma is is thought of as as a very important stage but it's it's this sort of karma that is the if you um, cultivate certain habits they're going to have consequences uh, moreover if you perform any uh, ethically charged act of volition or or inclination it's going to have results if you want something you're going to be stressed and disappointed when you when you're not able to get what you want. If you dislike something, you're going to be stressed and disappointed when you get it. Um, learning that our responses to experience are 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 uh, important, have a weight to them. How we respond to something. If we respond by liking, disliking. If we respond with worry. If we respond with fear. All of these have consequences. So we acknowledge these cause and effect relationships. What we really have a problem with isn't so much, I think, past life karma. It's just getting past this idea that the mind and the body are separate. Because if the mind is separate from the body, then it's going to continue after death. And, and that uh, manner of continuing is going to depend very much upon the state of mind and the habits that exist at the moment of death. And given that we know the the, you know, the place of birth is is a womb, if it if we were to accept that it does actually happen, then we're dealing with the uh, the formation of a fetus, which is going to be influenced, influenced by many things, but influenced by the mind that comes to be, that continues on into the fetus. Also the choosing, the, the forming of the volition, the wish to be born here or born there, it's going to be very much dependent on the state of mind. And so it's not that the concept of past life karma is is somehow a a categorically different concept uh, from present life cause and effect is that it's merely an extension and an extrapolation of it. Uh, so if you want to understand you know, why we are the way we are here and now and where our acts are going to lead us in, in future lives, I mean, based on past lives and future lives, you really only have to look at the state of mind 
and how states of mind in the present moment have consequences. How someone who is miserly, stingy, uh, as a result is going to be uh, unable to, unable, unwilling, is going, is going to have this corrupt state of mind where they're not able to enjoy. They're constantly worried about having to share and concerned and jealous often. Um, obsessed about their wealth, not wanting to spend it. I mean, the funny thing about people who are miserly is they don't ever enjoy life. And think a person who saves and scrimps and saves their money up would be happy because they have all this money, but you know, that's a corruption of mind. The only way to be truly happy, truly happy, is to be able to let go completely and not be... Um, not be not be worried, concerned about whether you have anything. And that's really the hardest thing to do. But um, the point being that our actions change us, and they corrupt us generally in the same way that we've um, expressed them. So if you hurt others you stand to be hurt yourself simply because of the way you set up your mind. I mean, one good example of this is how people who are angry and mean and, and unpleasant to others tend to um, be negligent in regards to their own care, not purposefully. But they're the kind of people who move quickly, who, who move without thought, who don't have... There really is this kind of a mirror effect whereby the way you treat others has an effect on how you treat yourself. We don't realize this. I mean, this doesn't isn't isn't in, immediately intuitive, um, but there is a mirror effect. Uh, moreover, there is an effect on others. So in this life, and if you are to suspend your doubt, this horrible doubt that people have that it's actually possible to to live after after the death of the body. If you're able to just suspend that, if you're able to uh, accept the the idea of the continuation. And you can appreciate the the uh, you know how our relationships are are affected by our actions, and you can be you can appreciate how not only our our mind continues, but the minds of those people who we hurt, and the minds of those people who we help, and uh, so a sort of a magic takes over. If you open up your paradigm from you know, birth to death and that's it, you know, and everything happens from here to there, if you open it up, then you have to start to, to create a, a theory and a framework for how this works and how minds interact with other minds, uh, even when they've lost their ability to, their, their easy ability to remember. Right, because the brain makes memory very easy, it, it provides us reminders. It's like sticky notes. The brain is like having sticky notes, easy to find. And the brain will always give you feedback and say, oh yeah, yeah, that's this. It's not that the brain contains memories, it contains um, what is it, mnemonic devices of a sort, uh, symbols, imagery. Um, you know, it's something, and an, a stimuli, stimulus, that uh, reminds us of something. It's how we, why we use mnemonic devices in the first place is because um, it's easier to store something that's a simple concept, and then you can bring it back. And I, or how we we store uh, acronyms and that kind of thing. All sorts of mnemonic devices. 
Um, so that's that's lost that immediate filing system. It's like losing your smartphone, and then you don't know your. You have to think of your schedule from the back, from the top of your head, or off the top of your head. Um, so we lose a lot of the memories of the people, but um, there's some kind of memory that's still there. And of course, all these memories can be gained through meditation practice. Memories of past lives can be gained, but it's not easy. Um, what's much easier is this sort of a sense of people, and it's sometimes wrong. Um, but it's um, if you accept that, that there's a continuation, it's not hard to understand how these guys who are beating this innocent man uh, would be easily persuaded that he was innocent because there's not a feeling of any sort of memory of him having done anything bad to them in the past. Whereas with the other guy, I mean, I guess there was some past life karma where he had actually hurt these people in the past. And so, um, you know, it, it seemed like the other guy was innocent, but in fact, he was receiving... I mean, it's not even a matter of being innocent or guilty, and this is another problem people have with karma is that uh, it seems to be on, it seems to be victim blaming right this whole verse here that uh, someone someone is is suffering it's because of their own deeds if someone is born poor or born crippled you know, or born this way or born that if someone is born rich well they deserve to be rich right it's highly convenient. It's an interesting argument that um, you know, this whole line of argument that the law of karma is convenient or it's, um, it's, it's, it serves a purpose, a nefarious sort of ulterior motive purpose. It's an interesting argument because it doesn't really matter. It's not like we present the law of karma and like, look at how wonderful this is. We more, we more present it as, look at how horrible this is. Look at how scary and dangerous this is. Yes, it is used, I think, to create social order and can thereby be perverted and corrupted by uh, people in power to convince poor people that they should just accept their lot in life. Of course, that's an extrapolation that has nothing to do with the law of karma. In fact, if you accept that you are poor, for example, because you were miserly in, in a past life, which I think is totally plausible in, I mean, understanding that it's more complicated than that, generally. Um, if anything, that should stimulate one to work hard and to um, even, even uh, be more concerned for rich people who are acting stingy and miserly, right? It's not a reason to then say, oh, okay, all you rich people keep your, your wealth because you deserve it. And the scary thing is the rich people who are hoarding their wealth are on their way to become poor just like uh, the others. But it doesn't really matter how it affects society. It's not meant to appease anyone. It's meant to explain how things work and to describe uh, an aspect of reality. Most importantly, it's just meant to it's meant to provide a single system. You know, past life karma is not, as to reiterate, is not categorically different from present life karma in the sense of what we can see through meditation practice. If you want to understand the law of past life karma and future karma, again, just understand it as a, an extension of what the Buddha is saying here. Purity and impurity, that's what it's all about. One, uh, it doesn't matter past life, future life, present life, between lives or within a single life. It all comes down to the purity and impurity that we can see through meditation practice. When you meditate, you can see all the problems. But one, the one thing that, if, if you doubt the meditation practice, it's common for people to come and doubt the practice, whether it's useful, helpful, whether one is capable of, of uh, performing um, the required, uh, undergoing the required practice, one of the ones capable of it. But one thing that's very hard to deny is what's wrong, 
right? The problem that we're trying to address, which is really, I think, should be a great reassurance. People are, uh, we get a lot of complaints that meditation doesn't work because you, your bad pro your, the problems just keep coming back and back and back and you practice and practice and you've still got all these problems. But you're missing re the real point. I mean, the most important point for a beginner meditator is that you see the problem. And um, that's really what karma is all about. It's about seeing that there is a problem. You, you don't get away with anything. Like I bring back Udi. I'm always thinking about Udi. He's, he wasn't a great monk, but he was a, he was a great soul. He was a great being of, in his own way. And he said, Noah, I tell you, no one can escape their karma. He said. And he was, he was very strong in this, and it was really always nice to, to listen to him talk. He passed away. He he got rectal cancer. Actually, it's an awful way to die. Um, speaking of karma, perhaps. But uh, you know, this is this is an important point for us to understand that yes, it's more complicated, and there's lots of factors, and who really knows how it all works? It's such a complicated system. But there is no doubt that um, we have problems inside and that they are problems. That these problems, these states of mind and habits are, are causing um, suffering and, and will continue to cause suffering. Now it's of course neat in stories like this to think about how over the long term that can actually work into the next life. I mean that's really a neat concept I and mean, it's really scary, but um, quite interesting to, ima to, to imagine that that might actually be true. Um, but there's such noise at that point that, again, yes, it's really hard to pinpoint exactly what it is that's causing what and why certain people died in the tsunami and certain other people survived seemingly miraculously. Uh, could be many reasons, obviously. But there is one reason and one aspect of the nature of reality, and that is kamaniyama, the, the orderliness of kamma. And so that's what this talks about. And in fact, it, it, it says something a little more. That's the, you know, sort of the, this idea behind the story. But the verse itself, as usual, is not completely related to the story. And um, I think it, sometimes it's easy to read these stories as just being made up to fit the verses loosely. But I think it's equally plausible to understand, yes, the stories were exaggerated, but that in each case, the Buddha wasn't really all that interested in, the, in, in, in what was being talked about, but he wanted to give a lesson that was actually useful for the people listening. That was usually related some way. But that's common for a teacher to not actually answer a question directly, but to give an answer that's actually useful. You know, redirecting back to what's important. And so the big point of this verse is that um, you have to purify yourself. And this is another aspect of the, of the teaching and an important point to understand about the practice that someone else can't save you. Someone else can't harm you. I mean, there's two, two things here. We blame other people for our suffering, right? A big part of the problem is how we blame others. And another, and the other side is that we we look to others. I mean, people look to my videos to try and save them, or not save them, but try to try and help them beyond what they're able to do. I mean, a lot of the questions some of you have seen are, how do I solve this problem? And it's not really, you know, it's not really something that I can solve for you. You know, I get people on the internet uh, asking for. advice, I guess, general advice on how to live their lives, and uh, it's not really how it works. I can give you the tools by which you can find answers yourself, but it's not really for me to give you answers. 
that's not really how, well, that's not how purification, that's not how suffering works and happiness comes. It comes from purifying yourself. And, uh, you know, this is, of course, a, a, a feature of many religions, looking to others. If you read in the Mahabharata, how the Yudhishthira, I think it is, lies, well, Arjuna lies as well, right? No, Yudhishthira lies. I don't know. They're, 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 the good guys behave kind of badly. And uh, then it appears that they're going to be sent to hell or something like that, but then God forgives them. In the end, God forgives them because they were doing what the order, what God wanted them to, or Krishna, I guess, or whoever. Anyway, I'm oversimplifying it terribly, but this is a feature of, very, of theistic religions generally. God's plan, God's forgiveness, all you have to do is X and you will be saved. Uh, the idea of being saved by someone else, putting your faith, putting your, your salvation in the hands of someone else, I mean, that is a very powerful movement, right? The Abrahamic religions are very much about putting your trust in someone else to save you. It's an important feature of Buddhism that it's not like that. It's a distinction. Well, of, of you know, let's say Theravada Buddhism and, and most Buddhism. Let's say most Buddhism is about self-liberation. It's something we should keep in mind both as Buddhists and more specifically as Buddhist meditators. So as Buddhists, you shouldn't think that these talks or that reading books or that following teachers is going to free you from suffering. This is why meditation is, is emphasized so strongly. It's why so many Buddhists turn to actual practice is because that should be very clear from teachings like this. You're not going to find salvation in my words or anyone's. Buddhas only point the way, the Buddha said. Akataro Tathagata. The Tathagatas only show the way. And uh, for meditators more specifically, you know, when you're meditating, you can't rely on me and you can't rely even on the, the, the technique. It's not magic, like if you repeat these words to yourself, you become enlightened. It has to come from you, from your uh, understanding, your, your awareness, you know. So, I mean, I, I think this is why, this, is a pro this becomes a problem where people rely upon the technique. Okay, he said to walk and sit. Well, I did all that walking and sitting. So I'm, now I'm going to become enlightened because I did what someone else told me to, right? It's again following someone else, they're going to save you. This practice is, the practice isn't going to save you. The practice is uh, providing you the tools by which you can save yourself. And that's an important distinction because it's, it's not about walking for an hour. It's about having the awareness and the, the clarity of mind to know that this foot is moving and then this foot is moving. The stomach is rising, the stomach is falling, and of course to know how the mind reacts to that, and to be there, and to be aware. It comes from yourself. You want to be pure, you want to be free. Certainly all this Buddhism that it ends up just being ritualistic about chanting and pouring water and shaking sticks and all of that stuff is not going to save you. No one else can save you, nothing external to you can save you. You can't pray to the Buddha for salvation. It's not how it works. An important verse, generally, and, and just to, to pro you know, just for the meaning that it, the, the understanding that it gives about what Buddhism is all about. You must save yourself and your actions and, and non-actions. They will determine. Uh, they will determine your future happiness and salvation. 
So, there you go. That's the Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. Have a good night.